Hello, welcome to the National D-Day Memorial, virtually at least. I'm John Long, the Director of Education here at the Memorial, and very pleased to welcome you to our first Lunchbox Lecture of 2021. Uh, and it's going to be a good one. Uh, and we've got a full slate of great programs coming up. Let me mention our uh, upcoming events. Uh, first of all, and, and we do have Lunchbox Lectures through May, every other Thursday. So another one in two weeks, another one in two weeks after that, uh, starting at noon uh, through May. And our next one is one I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, it is on the Dieppe raid of 1942. Dick Elder, one of our volunteers, son of a D-Day veteran, will be speaking on Dieppe. And if you don't know about Dieppe, absolutely turn tune in. Uh, title is The Dieppe Raid, A Disaster or Valuable Learning Lesson for D-Day. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to evaluate which of those is most true. It's on Thursday, January 21st at noon. Uh, and very much looking forward to that. Uh, if you've been tuning in to our programs uh, this past pandemic year, you also know we have been offering a virtual book club as well, where we choose a book related to the Second World War. And April, our president and I get together and, and discuss it, answer your questions, welcome your comments. Uh, and our next virtual book club will be on Tuesday, March 9th at 1 o'clock. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and we will be discussing uh, for the first time a work of fiction, historical novel, as opposed to a work of history. Uh, and that book is All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, and we are looking forward to that as well. Uh, and then, as I say, virtual lunchbox lectures every uh, two weeks uh, through May uh, on uh, right where you're watching now. So uh, join us for all of that. But it's my pleasure today to introduce our Lunchbox Lecture with Keegan Chetwin of the Military Aviation Museum in Virginia Beach, one of the members along with us of uh, the World War II Heritage Alliance in Virginia. And uh, Keegan is a uh, fascinating individual to get to know, and you will enjoy his talk. He is the director of the Military Aviation Museum and uh, that museum describes itself as a one-of-a-kind destination where historic aircraft are preserved and flown amidst a backdrop of historic structures recovered from military airfields around the world. If you've never visited the, uh, the Military Aviation Museum of Virginia Beach, make the trip over there. It's a fascinating place, a, a huge hangar of aircraft. And if you're a World War II aviation buff, it's a must see on your bucket list. So I absolutely be there. But uh, Keegan uh, has more than a decade experience working in, uh, in the museum in both the U.S. and Canada uh, in uh, collections and visitor services and now as the, uh, uh, the director of the museum there in Virginia Beach. He's also uh, a founding member of the team that established the Comic Con Museum in San Diego. And Keegan, I'd like to hear more about that sometime. Um, he's member was a member of the headquarters staff of the Commemorative Air Force for five years, uh, and during that time, uh, he was helped to lead the effort to save a C-47 called That's All Brother, which was one of the lead aircraft for the airborne drops on D-Day. Uh, so thank you for that work in preserving D-Day history as well. Keegan was born in Singapore lived in Dubai for a while, and now, of course, calls Norfolk, Virginia his home and works in Virginia Beach. Uh, today, he'll be telling us a little bit more about the museum and some of the aircraft that they house there. But uh, Keegan, uh, come on up and join us. And let me also say, by the way, Keegan's having a little trouble with his webcam, so you may not be able to see him, his face, uh, but you'll hear his voice and see his slides in a little bit. So Keegan, welcome. Uh, John, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, everyone out there uh, similarly feels that the uh, maximum space that can be afforded to pictures of airplanes, uh, so much the better. Um, so I, I, I apologize that uh, I don't have a working webcam at the moment. And uh, the even bigger apology is that we're not uh, all conducting this walking through our hangar out here at the museum, getting up close with these airplanes. Uh, but I've tried to assemble uh, some photography from, you know, over the 
the, the decade or so, a uh, little more than a decade that the museum has been open uh, that really captures what we do here and the significance of these important airplanes. Um, I've tried to keep it largely in terms of modern imagery that, that's been captured of these airplanes since uh, since their wartime service, uh, so that everyone can kind of enjoy the, the full color richness of, of what it is to experience these airplanes uh, firsthand. I think part of what we do here that's so special is that we still fly the airplanes. And so a lot of these images do try to capture that as well. Uh, we don't fly them every day. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how you can have your opportunity to see the airplanes in flight uh, towards the end of the presentation. But I think the, the first thing that I wanna do today is um, <laughs> just thank the D-Day Museum, um, uh, the, the National D-Day Memorial um, for, for having me. Uh, we've run a series of webinars here at our museum uh, throughout the, the pandemic year, as it was described, um, that had about 40 webinars and, and pretty much universally, I was had the easy job of welcoming everyone and uh, kind of sitting back to enjoy the presentation. And I think that uh, now that the shoe is on the other foot, I'm nervous about technology and everything else. And uh, so <laughs> hopefully everything works kind of the way we want it to. Uh, but before we get started into that, um, I, I do want to just say that, um, you know, First, our webinar series was a response to the kind of craziness of the pandemic and, and having to be able to keep connected with everyone in a virtual space. Um, and that presented challenges unto itself, but we were put in the unusual situation of, of having webinar programming running right after, uh, you know, the protests in Richmond and everything else. And it's it's been a troubling year from that perspective. Um, and as we, again, find ourselves sitting here, you know, with with events of national and historical significance having happened the preceding day. I think it's more important now than ever the work that museums like ours do to catalog what this great country can achieve when it's united, when we're all pulling together for the, the same set of outcomes. Um, I won't dwell on it too much. That's not really what we're here to talk about today, but um, I'm, I'm sure that there are some of you out there that, that share my sense that we can learn a great deal from the World War II generation. The country didn't enter the war united. The country definitely had partisan politics at that time and everything as well. But when the scale of the challenge is such that it is a, a threat to all Americans, uh, we're able to pull together and do some pretty amazing things. So hopefully what we saw yesterday is the start of, of, a, of a different era, of a more united time. Um, anyway, moving on let from me, that. Let me throw uh, in, uh, by sure. the way, Keegan. Uh, if you have a question for Keegan during the presentation, we will take those at the end, but you are welcome to type them into the comment feature. And uh, when time comes, we will pass those on to Keegan. But uh, certainly appreciate those words uh, today and uh, it's a very historic time. Um, and uh, I will shut up now and turn it over to you. Looking forward to this. John, I'm gonna to endeavor to switch it to my presentation now. So hopefully everyone is, is able to see that. Um, the first thing I have to do is say thank you to the tremendously talented photographers in our aviation community, um, broadly nationwide. There are some tremendous artists uh, among our, our pool of aviation photographers. I am not a photographer. I did not take the pictures in this presentation. They do all show our airplanes um, that we house and care for and restore and fly here at the museum. And uh, so big thank you has to go to all of those photographers. There are just too many to name included in this presentation, but I, I wanna make sure that they know that the, the art in what they do is certainly appreciated by those of us here at the museum. And I think more broadly in the aviation community. Uh, this is our D model Mustang Double Trouble II. Um, it's, it's one of the more popular airplanes here. I think the Mustang is perhaps the iconic World War II airplane as far as most Americans are concerned. Um, in England, of course, they have the Spitfire and it's it's their favorite airplane and it's the airplane that saved their nation. I think the, uh, the Mustang rises to that mantle here in the United States. And in and of itself, it's an incredible feat of engineering from its wing design to the uh, reduced visual distortion of its, its uh, shaped bubble canopy. Everything about this airplane is a design response to a set of challenges that emerged, um, you know, even, be even before the United States had entered the war. Uh, we have more than 65 airplanes here on the campus, so we do not have time to cover all of them. And it, I, my apologies if we do not hit on your favorite airplane today. We have tried to assemble here a selection of images of the fan favorites, as it were, uh, the airplanes that people travel here to see. And hopefully that will include many of the airplanes you're all familiar with. Uh, interesting side note, uh, this is not the original Double Trouble II. Uh, that airplane, uh, this airplane 
you know, wears those markings in tribute to that original fighter squadron. Uh, the reason the airplane was named Double Trouble was because the uh, original pilot had left two girlfriends back here in the United States when he had deployed. Uh, and he knew there was an uh, imminent situation of trouble uh, brewing for him when, <laughs> when he returned home. Uh, Double Trouble 2, because the original airplane that bore the name had actually been um, destroyed uh, while being flown by another member of the squadron. And so uh, the crew chief reapplied the name to the new aircraft and, uh, you know, applied the suffix to, to it there. Um, our story, the Military Aviation Museum is really kind of an interesting thing. It's a relatively recent emergence in the landscape of, of historical institutions. Um, it is a private collection that turned into a public attraction that became a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and it's been operating vintage military aircraft since 2008. Though the Military Aviation Museum on paper was formed ahead of that date, um, it took some time to assemble the buildings and structures and the collection that you see out here today. Of course, that's our, our Mustang again, Double Trouble Two. Uh, we won't talk too much more about it. But I think a really interesting dimension of, of this kind of collection is that what we see here is, yes, it's a big collection of airplanes and they're very cool. They have intrinsic value because they're they're rare, they're unusual. But what we see in these airplanes is, is a lot more meaning. We see them as monuments to the men and women who built, flew, and maintained them during the war. Every single airplane is a time capsule that's that's bearing a number of different stories that all diverge out from, from that single airframe. They, they're kind of a time machine in a way. Um, it, it sounds kind of cheesy to describe it that way, but you know, this is a, a great photo of our wildcat kind of looking off into the distance. And you can definitely imagine um, in, in looking at this image, you can imagine the the things that this airplane has seen in its, uh, you know, more than 75 years on this earth. Now, this particular airplane was built by Eastern Aircraft. There's a story there about General Motors converting for wartime aircraft production. There's the women that were brought into the factories as Rosie the Riveters to, to assemble these incredible airplanes. This airplane carries with it the stories of aviators who flew in the South Pacific. And, and really intriguingly, this particular airplane has a truth to place for us here uh, in Virginia Beach because it ended the war as a training platform at the naval training bases here in this area, particularly um, the auxiliary station here in Pungo is where this Wildcat was serving out its, uh, its wartime years, training pilots as part of hunter-killer groups and everything that would deploy to the Atlantic to hunt German submarines from escort carriers. Um, so again, every piece of metal here in this building carries this tremendous weight along with it. They're, they're enormously significant. And uh, one of the things we feel challenged to do here every day at the museum is to find ways for guests to connect with those various stories. Uh, we've assembled this incredible collection and one of the big remaining tasks to be done for us here as a, as a living, breathing museum is to, to find more different, unique, special ways for people to connect. And we will talk about a few of those here in a little while. Um, but I think one of the most important things that, that we hold dear here at this museum is that we provide people a chance to experience history. Um, you know, the, the analogy that a museum has, you know, a leg up on a book because you can kind of see the tangible object there and it's a real connection to the past and it can make a narrative or a story real for people. Uh, that's certainly true. And I think every aviation museum in the country does in fact provide that value to its community. I think what's really interesting here is though, when you see one thunder into the sky or you're there, you know, 50 feet away from it when it's starting up and you get to talk to the pilots who fly it and the people here at our facility that maintain it, um, it becomes a kind of a transformational multi-sensory experience where you just can't replicate it. These airplanes have a smell. There's a uniqueness to the sound. Um, it's certainly something amazing to see veterans uh, from the Warriors come out here and hear that you know round engine sound again. And they'll tell you it's like nothing else in the world. But it's equally amazing to see kids who have only ever heard about these airplanes or seen them in books or on the internet or in movies to get out here and to experience that as well. So um, we are committed to this sort of mantra of keep them flying that, that was so popular during the war years, um, albeit for a different reason. Um, this is part of our fulfillment of a commitment to, to remember what the wartime generation did for us. Um, you know, it, it doesn't come without work. That steerman that was in the picture previously with the young man sitting inside the cockpit, that was part of one of our summer camp programs. Uh, we do give the opportunity for the kids to actually handle the airplanes and help service them. 
Uh, what's happening here, though, is the Stearman is uh, coming back from a restoration. This photo was taken earlier this year. The whole airplane had been uh, recovered, repainted. Um, it bears naval training markings as a tribute to our naval aviators in our community. Uh, the airplane itself did actually serve as an Army Air Force's training aircraft during the war. Uh, what you see here is the uh, wings being reattached and the Stearman being rigged. Uh, so they're going to tension those wires, get the wings perfectly uh, positioned as they need to be to allow safe and stable flight. Uh, so this is our team down at the fighter factory that's doing that. Um, there are about 15 staff here at the museum and 17 or so mechanics that are professional down at the fighter factory that are, are needed to kind of interpret, care for this enormous, you know, more than 65 aircraft collection. Uh, but we also couldn't do it without our 240 volunteers. Um, it's been a challenging year for the volunteers, many of whom have uh, comorbidities or conditions that have kept them away from the museum and from the work that they love. Uh, so we never miss an opportunity to thank them for their, for their continued support of what we do here. It just wouldn't be possible without them. So we're gonna get into talking about the airplanes specifically that are here in the collection uh, rather than the museum in a more general sense. And the, I think it makes sense to start with the first airplane uh, that was put into the collection. Um, we, I say the collection stands unequaled in this slide. Um, that's true, there, there are larger collections. The Commemorative Air Force, for instance, has more than 160 flying World War II airplanes. That's numerically larger than our collection, uh, but it's dispersed and it's located at great facilities that you can view all around the country. There's probably one in a community near you. Um, but what we have assembled here in Virginia Beach is an unparalleled collection of flying airplanes that you can come here and see. On any given day, these airplanes are here, you can experience them. We don't believe in putting up ropes around the airplanes. You'll get closer to them here than you really will anywhere else. But uh, to say a little bit about our P-40, um, that, that the wreckage in this image is of the museum's P-40, which was the first aircraft uh, to be added to the collection. Uh, this photo was taken outside Murmansk on the Russian tundra where this particular airplane had been uh, shot down during the war years. Murmansk, of course, is a, a port that was incredibly important to the Soviet Union. It was their principal connection to the Western Allies, and it was an area that had to remain open in an effort to keep the Soviet Union in the war. Um, this airplane was actually supplied by the Americans to the British, who ultimately then supplied it to the Soviets in an effort to keep that vital line of, of, of transport open and to keep the Germans well away from attacks on Murmansk. Unfortunately, they weren't always successful in doing that. This airplane was shot down while flying with a guards regiment there outside Murmansk. Um, and the airplane stayed there on the tundra for 50 years. A lot of times people come into the collection and they see these great airplanes and they don't necessarily know, you know, how much original metal is there and how much of that airplane is reusable. I will talk a little bit more about it later in the presentation, but what you can see here, I mean, it still does look like an airplane. There's obviously need for some additional parts to be added and many to be serviced. Um, but that airplane became this one. Uh, after more than 50 years on the Russian tundra, um, this combat veteran was found in the mid 90s. Um, and it would take about seven years to return it to flight from the state that you saw it in previously. Uh, the first flight of the airplane was in 2003, back in April. Um, and the airplane continues to be a regular operator here at the museum. It's a, it's a much loved airplane. Um, th there are probably people out there who would ask, you know, if it had combat history with the VVS, the Soviet Air Force, why wouldn't you restore it that way? Um, when, whenever these restoration projects are ongoing, there's always a long discussion about what is it we want to tell in terms of a story? How do we want to interpret this, this piece of history? And uh, we felt like the story that needed to be told or that was absent from our collection, um, you know, in, in more recent times is, is that of the Flying Tigers. We have real Soviet airplanes here as well. Um, we do do a reasonably good job of, of interpreting the Eastern Front and the air war there. Uh, so for us, you know, the iconic P-40 role uh, was as a member of the Flying Tigers. Um, they did receive this model of P-40 very late in their time in China. A um, little bit more about them. The Flying Tigers obviously is the popular name, um, but the American Volunteer Group is the official name. Uh, these were Americans who volunteered to go fight the Japanese in China ahead of the United States' entry into the war. Um, many famous aviators like Pappy Boynton from later in the war actually had their uh, you know, early combat time as part of the Nationalist Chinese Air Force in China, uh, defending the Chinese against um, Japanese aggression. So this particular airplane wears the markings of uh, David Lee Tex Hill. Um, it's, 
it's an airplane he used during his attack on the Salween River Gorge. Um, he had a, a earlier model that was his more regular aircraft of choice, but uh, the additional bomb payload that was granted to this model of P-40 meant that um, knowing the nature of the mission they were going on, uh, uh, Tex is said to have acquired uh, one of these fancy new P-40s that had just arrived in theater uh, for that purpose. So another interesting thing we don't often get to show off to our guests is uh, Tex Hill actually did have the opportunity to uh, visit this airplane. I believe he did fly in it. Um, the inside of the baggage door bears his signature as the kind of seal of approval on the uh, the paint scheme and on the story that's being told with the airplane, uh, which is a, a really special, I think, outcome for an airplane that had been abandoned uh, very close to the Arctic Circle uh, for, for so many years. Um, every one of the airplanes has a, a sort of deep story like that that we can go into. Um, in fact, we can go in, in more depth on some of them. Um, we do have, you know, original footage, photos, things like that from the Warriors that track back to a number of our airplanes. Um, what's in this image is perhaps, again, one of the most iconic airplanes of the war. We, we spoke about it a little while ago, um, the Supermarine Spitfire. So the Spitfire is the, uh, the airplane that the British uphold is the airplane that saved the world. Uh, I think there's maybe a good argument to be made for that because the war might not have gone the way that it did had the British been knocked out during the Battle of Britain. Uh, and both the Spitfire and the Hurricane played incredible roles uh, during that conflict. Just close this here. The uh, the Spitfire you see here, this is actually film footage. Those of you who've seen uh, the Netflix, well, it's not a Netflix movie, but it's film that is now on Netflix called Thunderbolt, are familiar with a wartime production that was made in Corsica, uh, cataloging an American fighter group uh, that was supporting uh, Allied advances in Italy. Uh, as part of the outtakes from that, there were several shots filmed of British aircraft operating at those same bases and in that same region. Uh, they happened to capture a particular Spitfire, MJ-730, this airplane, um, which has gone on to uh, have a special significance to us here at the museum uh, because we've ended up with that same airplane. Uh, you see that it wears slightly different markings. The markings that are on it now um, correspond to a period later in the war. Uh, but at the time that it was filmed, it had the call letter W there on the nose, and that was uh, marked up on the tail of the airplane as well. This particular airplane was built in 1943 at Castle Bromwich in the United Kingdom. Um, it had several assignments in the Mediterranean. Uh, early on, it flew over the Anzio beachheads. Uh, it would later fly 95 escort missions, and uh, the markings it wore during that period are what you saw in the film. Uh, it would end up the war, however, uh, over in Greece, uh, where it earned the uh, nickname the CO's Query. Uh, you see there's a question mark painted on the side of the airplane. Um, that's, not, that's not a modern joke. Uh, that's authentic markings to this airplane uh, that stem back to a late war joke uh, being told around that unit. The CO wasn't sure how to mark his airplane because he didn't necessarily belong to A flight or B flight. Um, so he, he was un uncertain. And uh, as crew chiefs do, they uh, they took that and uh, went ahead and painted the question mark on the side of the airplane as a symbol of that uncertainty. Uh, so it's remained a, a, a really particularly interesting story that goes along with this airplane. Um, it rounded out the war attacking um, Axis targets in Yugoslavia and retreating convoys of troops moving through Yugoslavia. Ultimately, the airplane would end up post-war in Italian service, um, later transferred to Israel as a training platform for their emergent air force. Uh, really interestingly, its immediate disposition prior to a restoration beginning uh, was that it was a piece of playground equipment in a kibbutz in, in Israel. So the airplane, uh, we have photos of it as playground equipment. It's uh, definitely something you can see if you come here to the museum. Um, we're pleased to see the airplane as it is now. It regularly flies with our Hawker Hurricane. Uh, earlier this year, we were able to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain uh, on the weekend adjacent to Battle of Britain Day. Uh, the uniqueness of the airplanes in our collection gives us a window to do some of the things uh, that other museums don't always necessarily get to take advantage of. We also have airplanes in the collection that are specifically configured to, to honor our hometown heroes. And so when we're selecting markings for the airplanes, uh, we do look for opportunities to pay tribute to servicemen from our region um, and, and our community who flew in these airplanes. Uh, so this is our uh, FG-1D Corsair. 
And uh, it, it is an example of some of those markings. We'll talk, talk a little bit about them in just a minute. Um, but our Hawker Hurricane, interestingly, also bears, um, you know, importantly, locally significant markings. Um, it's marked as DZ. O, which is a uh, hurricane flown by John Kenneth Havland, who was a Virginian, um, who was is thought to be the only American who flew during the Battle of Britain and survived the war. Uh, I think we've all heard the story of the stories of the Eagle Squadrons, and they certainly did exist, and they did arrive, and they were pivotal in the defense of the United Kingdom. They were, however, late for the, the RAF's actual considered period that is defined as the Battle of Britain. Um, there were only a handful of Americans who were basically individuals with dual citizenship who had enlisted in the RAF in enough time to be actually be able to fly in the Battle of Britain. Uh, Havland was one of those people. Uh, he later returned to Virginia and uh, became a uh, committed member of the UVA community and was an educator. Um, but if you come out and see our hurricane, that's a, a great connection that it has there. Um, it, Again, he's thought to have been the only American who who did that, who actually survived the war um, because of the intensity of the fighting and the duration of it just for, for so many years. To, to go back to our Corsair, um, it's marked as an aircraft from VF-17, the Jolly Rogers. Our Corsair honors a gentleman called the Kitty Hawk Kid, uh, Lieutenant Sheldon Ray Beecham, uh, who was credited with shooting down two Japanese Zero fighter planes. And you could see the, the two kill markings there under the windshield. Um, you know, to go into... Ray's story is a really, really interesting ex activity, but because we're all so close together here in this region, I would encourage people who have the opportunity to actually visit uh, Dare County down in the Outer Banks in North Carolina, visit their aviation museum there at the airport, and they have a great local tribute there to, to the Kitty Hawk Kid. Um, the airplane continues to fly here in these markings, and uh, you can learn more about it coming here, uh, coming here to the museum. But uh, this great picture kind of captures what people have the opportunity to see here uh, when we are flying the airplanes. Uh, the museum is a 130 acre campus. Uh, we have our own grass strip runway. Uh, that's kind of what the airplanes like to operate off of. And uh, what's really special about that is you're very, very close to it. They don't taxi down you know, a mile away to, to, to take off and you have to wait till they come back overhead. You really do get to see them kind of at takeoff power coming straight down the runway so that you can get great photos of them. Uh, that's during our air shows, but also uh, during what we call summer of flight. So when the weather is appropriate, the ground isn't too soft. It, it's definitely too soft right now with all the rain we've had. Uh, but during the summer months when it's nice and, and hard and serviceable, the airplanes do fly every Saturday here at the museum. Uh, we pick different airplanes or different collections of airplanes from, from within the hangars and, and pull them out, fly them, tell you a little bit more about them and, and what they did during the war. So this next airplane is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, it's definitely uh, a sleeper hit as well. Uh, when we scheduled the summer of flight for this airplane, we did not realize it would be our most attended socially distant activity with people spread uh, you know, 10 feet apart all over the property to, to, to enjoy this airplane. Uh, it's the PBY Catalina. A lot of people call it the CAT. It was known in uh, Army Air Force's service as the Dumbo, uh, obviously because of its uh, you know, similarities with the big eared uh, flying elephant. This particular photo was taken at the Arsenal of Democracy event, which was a great event that was scheduled to happen uh, during the pandemic year, uh, during 2020, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. Uh, the event was postponed and special permissions were granted for the, uh, the re-attempt uh, in September to allow everyone to gather the airplanes and, 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 and attempt to pay tribute to our World War II veterans by bringing uh, about 70 of these World War II airplanes flying down the, the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, everything was lined up and all necessary government agencies were, were very cooperative and made it possible to happen. Unfortunately, the weather gods uh, intervened and on both the day it was supposed to happen and the intended rain date, uh, we weren't able to fly the airplanes in that tribute. However, um, when reflecting on the attention that was brought to the, the the service and the sacrifice of the World War II generation just by the airplanes arriving at airports up in the DC metro area. Um, we consider it to have been a mission accomplished anyway. I think the spirit of, of the arsenal of democracy, which was the people of this country coming together and building these incredible machines. Uh, I think that spirit was alive and well uh, there. We, we, you know, flying with us at the time that uh, this picture was taken was actually the, uh, the granddaughter of a PBY pilot during the war, and she had family photos on board the airplane. And, and you know, it's important for us to keep that connection alive, especially as we lose our, our World War II veterans in, in, in ever increasing numbers. 
Uh, the PBY is also a special airplane for us here because it does have a local connection to, to Norfolk history. The airplane was built in 1943 uh, in San Diego in October. I was flown a little bit around the bay in San Diego, uh, making sure it was watertight and uh, things like that. It is a flying boat. It's intended to land in water. Uh, this particular one is amphibious. It does have wheels that can come down, as you saw in the previous image. Um, the, the airplane was then you know, dispatched from San Diego to Norfolk. It took about 19.2 hours. Uh, it's still in the logbooks that we have, that, that initial flight to reposition the airplane for, for combat usage. And the reason we know it was uh, with combat usage in mind is because the airplanes left the factory without guns and everything else, uh, because guns were in shorter supply than the airplanes in many cases. So when they arrived to a sort of forward deployment point is when armor, guns, all of that stuff was included in the airplane. Uh, that way, if they were being dispatched to a training base or something like that, that didn't need guns, they didn't have them with them. Uh, so what you can see here is uh, a couple pages from that log book. And on the right uh, is the armor plating being installed in the airplane. You can see that itemized list of everywhere that they are supposed to put it. And uh, on the left, you can see that uh, the airplane had been flown for 60 hours at the point at which it arrived in Norfolk. So 19.2 across the country. And the balance of that was local flying. Um, you can see that they uh, they installed the pickle on the yoke for, for ordnance deployment. Um, they camouflaged the airplane to be more appropriate for the sort of North Atlantic fog. So white and gray paint scheme was applied to it. Um, they also modified the torpedo racks uh, to allow the airplane to carry ordnance, depth charges, and the like. Uh, the airplane was assigned to an anti-submarine responsibility. Um, I think we have a tendency to kind of forget that there was a raging war going on just about seven to ten miles offshore uh, from here in Virginia Beach. Uh, the Germans had brought submarines across. Uh, by 1942, they were mostly outside of the immediate vicinity of population centers like Virginia Beach and the Outer Banks. Um, but they were still very much a threat in the Atlantic. And so resourcing against submarines was applied continuously throughout the year. Uh, this airplane would ultimately forward deploy to Morocco, uh, where it would seek to close the uh, Straits of Gibraltar to submarine navigation. Uh, it and a number of other airplanes would fly routine patrol missions uh, in that region, trying to negate that area uh, to use by submarines. It would also fly some uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, before ultimately returning to the United States. So we feel very fortunate that we have this great story that goes along with this incredible airplane. Um, but also interesting to our collection is a, th this concept of the world's only. Um, represented in our collection are some of the rarest aircraft in the world. Um, some of them are, 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 we're the one place in the United States that you can see one fly. And uh, for a time, uh, following its flight in 2012, our de Havilland Mosquito uh, was the only one in the world that could fly. And uh, it's a special honor and a special distinction to be able to house airplanes of that significance. Um, what you've got here is a view from inside the cockpit of the mos Mosquito, and you can understand probably the technical and mechanical complexity of a restoration um, that yields this amount of sophisticated equipment. Um, you'll notice that it's fairly stock. Um, our airplanes do vary. There is some modern equipment for safety reasons that has to be installed in the airplanes to be able to operate them today legally. Um, but we, wherever possible, we do try to return the airplanes um, to, a, to a kind of stock appearance as they would have been uh, during the war. This picture can only do so much lifting, though. Um, it can't convey to you the tremendous sound uh, that this airplane makes. The Mosquito, of course, has two uh, 1,700 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engines uh, seated either side of this image, just outside that cockpit. Uh, this next one may do some justice to the airplane. Uh, you can see the, the positioning of the two engines. Those are uh, Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. They're V12s uh, together and alongside the light weight of the, the Mosquito, sometimes known as the Wooden Wonder. Um, the the air, airplane's able to achieve speeds of over 400 miles an hour. Um, you know, during the war, this this airplane is in a, in a speed space competitive with early jet aircraft and so on. Uh, the Mosquito is a, a profound technological accomplishment uh, made by the British during the war. Um, if you get the chance to come and see it, you'll see that it is it is largely wood. Um, there are few metal uh, components on the airplane, and there are places where heat or strength necessitate the use of metal, be it gun barrels, exhaust pipes, landing gear. Um, the, the wood is an interesting story unto itself. Uh, it's a mixture of spruce, ash, birch, fir, and Ecuadorian balsa wood uh, that was used to produce original mosquitoes 
And it's one of the things that made the restoration of this airplane so particularly complex and, and take such a long time was that the manufacturing techniques, the glue that was used to laminate these woods into various types of plywoods, um, that know-how was lost after the war. That that way of doing things had to be reinvented in order to facilitate the restoration of this airplane. Now, we didn't do this here on site. There was a team in New Zealand that actually conducted this restoration, and to them, that, that credit must go. Um, but they spent, I guess, almost a decade perfecting the art of actually shaping the wood to build this airplane. Uh, and it came here to the United States and, and, and flew and continues to fly as part of our collection. And just an example of, of one of the really special things that you can see when you come here to the Military Aviation Museum. I've got an eye on the time here and uh, we're gonna keep moving swiftly along. Uh, we also have Axis airplanes represented in the collection. Um, I think it's important for us to make note of the fact that we do this because part of our belief in, in the interpretation of the war is that it's important to understand the war as it was. Um, as we lose veterans, as we lose people in our community who had firsthand exposure to the war, we're losing pieces of the story along with them. We're losing the understanding of, of just how serious and significant a challenge the war really was. Um, you know, we have a tendency to kind of base some of our history learning these days on the movies and you see the American military shows up and it's awesome and it's ready to, you know, kick butt and take names. And there's a tendency in the younger generation, especially to look on the war and, and the allied victory in the war is kind of a fait accompli thing. It just, we, we showed up and we won. That's how it works. Um, having the German airplanes and the Axis airplanes represented in our collection gives us an opportunity to be truthful and realistic about the scale and scope of the challenge our airmen were up against. Um, it helps us understand the technological hurdles that had to be overcome in this country to be able to, to contribute in the way that we did to the ultimate allied victory. And uh, so that's why we keep these German airplanes here. When we fly them, we fly them with that context in mind. We share that context with people. Um, the Messerschmitt 109 that's pictured here is perhaps the most iconic adversary airplane from the war years. It's uh, Germany's sort of go-to fighter airplane. And uh, it's a uh, it's a really interesting thing to look that closely at something that had the potential to do that much damage and that much destruction. Uh, the 109s were part of a system of air defense over Nazi Germany that was arrayed against our strategic bombing efforts in airplanes like B-17s and B-24s. And early in the war, when we were flying those missions unescorted, uh, the 109s and the flak batteries mounted on the ground could easily knock out 40 American aircraft in a single morning. Uh, each airplane being crewed by 10 or more men meant that there were 400 less men in the mess hall that night than had been there in the morning. That's a, a profound realization for many people is to understand just how hard fought this war really was. And, uh, you know, in, in having the 109 here, we can understand that we didn't enter the war in, in the sort of apex technological position. We, we turned ourselves into that during the war years. This airplane had leading edge slats on the wings to aid its maneuverability and wing loading. This airplane had a fuel injected engine at a time when every American fighter was, was using a naturally aspirated carbureted engine. Um, this airplane is basically the reason that things like the P-51D Mustang come into being is as a design response to this airplane. Um, we don't just have World War II airplanes here at the museum. Uh, those of you who have been down here, you know we have uh, some other interesting things as well. Uh, in our lobby, we have a, a real German V-1 flying bomb uh, that has uh, obviously been deactivated. Uh, but we do have a second engine for that uh, that we do run on occasion. We also have a uh, Flak 88 gun that does fire. Uh, we don't live fire it. Uh, we, we have neighbors, uh, but we do occasionally put uh, blank rounds through it so people can see how an 88 battery is operated. Uh, definitely like and follow us on Facebook if you're curious about the opportunity to participate in some of those kinds of activities. Uh, but we also have a great World War I collection here on site. Um, World War II uh, and World War I share, share interesting narrative perspectives. And in, in terms of the development of the airplane, they're key periods in history. In our World War I collection, uh, we have largely replicas in the World War I collection, um, you know, built to the 
stats and specifications of the originals. However, the Curtis Jenny that you're seeing in the picture there is basically America's first mass produced military airplane. And uh, it is original, it is 103 years old. Uh, we also have a Thomas Morse Scout located uh, in the World War I hangar that you're seeing there. Uh, that is also 103 years old. Uh, both airplanes are still capable of flight. We are having a magneto issue with the Curtis Jenny, which means it hasn't been seen uh, out flying here lately. And the Thomas More Scout is an interesting one because it still has its original rotary engine, uh, which is basically an engine that spins uh, as distinct from a radial, which is fixed, that then spins the propeller. Uh, the rotary spins along with the propeller. And uh, that creates interesting gyroscopic forces on the airplane, meaning it can be difficult to fly. Uh, so getting the chance to see these World War I airplanes in action can be a very rare and special opportunity. Um, the building that you see behind the Jenny in this picture is our World War I hangar. Um, it is a full scale exact replica of a World War I hangar facility in the United Kingdom. Um, one of the few additions we made to it uh, was electric lighting and uh, special clips that allow the roof to withstand uh, hurricane force winds that we experience here in Virginia uh, that they weren't super concerned about uh, in 1918 uh, England. So we do also have airplanes uh, newer than World War II, uh, although just barely. We, we are not a collection known for operating uh, Cold War jets, um, something we get asked about a lot. Um, we just don't have the kind of facility here that lends itself to operating um, you know, Mach 2 jet aircraft. We do have a German uh, replica German Messerschmitt 262 early jet in our collection. Um, it has been having some brake issues and it doesn't really love to operate from the grass strip over here, so it isn't displayed on site. Uh, but we do throughout the year look for opportunities to give people a chance to come see that airplane. Uh, this that we're looking at, though, is our Douglas AD-4 Sky Raider. Um, it's painted in a Korean War paint scheme, uh, but it'd be familiar to those of you that had combat experience in Vietnam or members of your family who did. Uh, the Sky Raider uh, was designed during World War II. Uh, it's a naval aircraft intended to operate from aircraft carriers, hence the, the wing folding. Uh, but it could carry the same ordnance load as a B-17. So that gives you an indication of just how much... Um, technology in terms of the sophistication of engines and everything had advanced by the time the war was winding down. Um, the Sky Raiders were built in limited quantity after the war because it was expected to be a new era for jet aircraft. Uh, jets were what everyone wanted. Jets are what Congress wanted them to build. And so Sky Raiders were somewhat limited uh, in terms of availability. However, when we went to war in Korea, uh, sorry, went to police action in Korea, however it's defined, um, I think it it's still very much a war, although often forgotten as one. Uh, the Sky Raiders and Corsairs of, of World War II vintage were kind of there on the front lines, and the Sky Raiders were able to perform close air support roles in Korea that would later set the pattern for what they did in Vietnam. Uh, this particular airplane is painted as a member of VA-195, the Dam Busters Squadron. Uh, it's painted as the airplane flown by Lieutenant Commander Swede Carlson. Uh, the Dam Busters got their name because they were able to destroy targets that the B-29s couldn't hit from higher altitude during that war against uh, you know, North Korean targets. Interestingly, this particular airplane actually did serve uh, during Korea aboard the USS Valley Forge as part of VA-55. Uh, those of you who've had uh, Navy experience in your lives and spent some time in the service, you might have actually seen this airplane. Uh, for many years, it, it was in front of Naval Air Station Atlanta as their gate guardian, and uh, it actually missed serving in Vietnam because it was uh, out front of Naval Air Station Atlanta at that time. So, uh, you know, during the Vietnam War years, the, the Sky Raider would go on to, you know, support helicopter uh, air rescue operations, uh, provide great ground support. The fact that the airplane was robust, tough, meant it could take ground fire, um, but it was also slow enough to put ordnance accurately on target, which is an interesting sort of paradoxical conundrum about using jets in that role. Um, this is kind of like the A-10 of its era, uh, where it looks a little bit obsolete and, and maybe isn't, uh, you know, as sleek and modern as everything else in the inventory, uh, but it certainly had a purpose. Uh, Congress and the Navy actually considered having more Sky Raiders built uh, in the 60s uh, during the Vietnam period because they were running out of parts for the few that they had. Uh, they were used by both the Air Force and the Navy. Um, and it's an imposing airplane. It doesn't really do justice to see just how big this airplane is relative to the others uh, from any of these particular pictures that we're showing, but uh, hopefully you guys will have the opportunity to come see it. Um, if you are gonna make a special trip for the Sky Raider, please don't do it right away. The Sky Raider is actually off display at the moment uh, in anticipation of, of making a short trip outside of the area. 
Um, we did have to remove it from the museum ahead of our runway getting soaked with rain. So again, it's it's not on display. It's it's over at a paved uh, runway airport, so it can have a little more flexibility in terms of its uh, uh, departure. Just going to kind of wrap us up here. Um, it is an ongoing process. Um, we talked about some great airplanes in the collection today. Um, it's, it's expansive, but it's not complete. Um, we still have more work that we're doing. Uh, we're very gracious, graciously supported by the the local Virginia Beach businessman who founded the museum. Um, it continues to actively seek these airplanes, continues to collect them, to seek to add them to the collection. Um, and we're, we're very fortunate to be in that position. So um, there are more stories we want to tell. There are restorations ongoing. Uh, we generally don't talk about them. Um, and if asked questions about that, I will unfortunately have to deflect. Uh, we don't talk about them because we like to preserve the specialness of the moment when they ultimately do arrive here in Virginia Beach and, and people can participate in that celebration altogether. Um, this is our P-39 Era Cobra a number of years ago. The airplane is finished. It did enter the collection about two years ago here in Virginia Beach, but uh, this was an in-process photo uh, taken where the restoration work was being performed uh, down in New Zealand. We do have an on-site uh, maintenance and rest restoration and repair facility uh, where similar scenes like this are played out day to day. It is currently not available for public viewing uh, owing to the challenges of the coronavirus restrictions placed on us by, by the government. Um, but hopefully we'll soon be reopening it, giving everyone a chance to see the work that's going on down there right now. Um, this airplane is actually in the shop at the moment getting uh, some work done. So it doesn't look quite uh, this far apart, but uh, some of that particular yellow zinc chromate is also visible currently. Uh, this is a picture of the Air Cobra in flight. Uh, it's an interesting airplane. It was uh, discovered in a North Australian jungle in 1963. Uh, they had to actually build a road in to get equipment to the airplane to be able to remove it. Um, the airplane's painted as uh, 420341. Uh, they always ditch the first four in applying the serial number to the actual airplane. And um, that airplane was a Lend-Lease airplane provided to the Soviet Union. Uh, we gave a great number of P-39s, considered a a sort of second string fighter by the U.S. Army Air Forces. We provided them in large quantity to the Soviets uh, by way of something called the Alcib route, uh, which basically saw the airplanes built in, in New York, flown to Great Falls, Montana, in many cases by women. The women Air Force service pilots could take responsibility for that leg of the journey. However, at Great Falls, the intention was for the airplane to cross an international border, uh, which meant that women were not permitted to make that leg. The airplanes were then flown across Canada to Alaska and outside of Nome, the airplanes were prepared and swapped uh, to Soviet pilots who would fly them the rest of the way across the Soviet Union to the front lines uh, on the Eastern Front. The airplane was, um, although sometimes maligned by American pilots, it was loved by Soviet pilots. Um, they liked having the engine actually behind the pilot, put the center of gravity of the engine in a, in right central in the airplane, giving it interesting maneuvering characteristics. Um, the airplane did have a cannon, uh, which did lead to a, a kind of a, a, a series of faulty assumptions that the airplane was used extensively with this cannon in an anti-armor role. Uh, the Soviets didn't really use it that way. It, it all stems from mistranslation. Uh, the Soviets used it for what they called close air support, which we then translated based on our kind of Western understanding of that to mean, oh, they shot at tanks and ground targets with it. And what they actually did was uh, stay immediately over the battle space with this airplane and attack German ground attack airplanes with this aircraft. And, and that's the utility that the cannon saw. Uh, we weren't actually able to supply them the armor penetrating ammunition for the cannon that would have been necessary to, uh, to, to provide a great anti-tank purpose for it. Uh, but interestingly, although this airplane wears the markings of an airplane that was lost uh, there along the Alcib route, um, this particular airplane, most of the metal in it uh, actually came from an airplane uh, 417215, which was built in 1941 in Buffalo, New York. Uh, that airplane was assigned to the 36th Fighter Squadron, uh, which was traveling from Australia to Papua New Guinea uh, early in the war in an effort to uh, sort of respond to mounting Japanese advances in that region uh, to kind of stem their advancement towards Australia and basically use Australia similar to how England was being leveraged in Europe as a kind of an unsinkable aircraft carrier in that region. Um, Lieutenant Walter Harvey was flying this particular airplane and they encountered some unanticipated weather on a ferry flight. Uh, transitioning from one base to the other. And he was forced down in this airplane uh, into the jungle. 
uh, Harvey did survive. He walked two days out to the coast uh, where he could be seen and then was rescued. Um, he went on to fly 131 combat missions successfully during the war. Uh, so this airplane, although it didn't see combat service, uh, has an interesting connection to those early days of the Pacific War uh, when airplanes were in many ways obsolete and outmatched by the Japanese airplanes they were to be up against. Uh, but it does serve as an interesting reminder that on occasion, um, weather and intervening circumstances can be as dangerous as uh, encountering enemy aircraft on your mission. Uh, so like I said, we're, we're in the process of winding down now and I'm, I'm eager to take some questions. Uh, we are a living collection. Uh, this is a picture of our TBM Avenger. Uh, for those of you who've been here in the last couple of years, you wouldn't have seen this airplane because after an unfortunate incident where the landing gear retracted while the airplane was sitting on the ground, um, you know, 75 year old hydraulics and all, uh, the airplane did enter a three year period of restoration has been off public display for that uh, duration. It is now back. Um, during the summer, the airplane was actually finished. Uh, we were able to showcase it uh, as part of a series of ground runs for the public, again, safely socially distant outside here on our 130 acre campus. Um, and we were also able to fly the airplane. Uh, this picture is of an earlier flight. It isn't of that particular first flight uh, following this most recent restoration. Um, but you know, this is what you get to see uh, from here on our back ramp, looking out at the runway. Uh, we have been known to, uh, you know, mock up a carrier takeoff and show just how quickly the airplane can get off the ground. Uh, but we are always mindful that uh, these airplanes don't really just belong to us. They belong to all of us. Um, they're part of the sort of cultural commonwealth of, of this country. And so what we see ourselves as is as custodians and caretakers of these airplanes. So we don't fly. Uh, a lot of aerobatics or anything like that. We don't bring the airplane right to the limits of its operational abilities. Uh, we respect these machines. We care for them. Um, you know, when you come out to see them fly, we can't always guarantee you that they will because there are some days they just don't want to start and uh, things like that. Challenges met in the war years by the simple answer of go and get another one. Uh, but we can't necessarily do that now. Um, you know, so it, it is a it is a persistent challenge. And if you come see them, we ask you to bear with us on, on that journey and that set of experiences. Uh, we don't just have single engine fighters. As I showed earlier, we do have the PBY and uh, another popular one is our uh, B-25. Uh, we have been able to electrically power the turrets and demonstrate them for people. Um, we'll probably be doing that again this coming April. So uh, commemorating the Doolittle Raid. So as we, as we do every April. Uh, so that might be an opportunity to look a little bit ahead and say, you know, hopefully the vaccine program rollout continues to go well across the state. We'll all have an opportunity to to see each other again, and uh, that'll give people a chance to, to come down and see this airplane. And while this is definitely uh, a very, very cool picture of a B-25, and I, I don't want to take anything away from it, um, this is actually our favorite picture of the B-25 uh, here on the staff at the museum. Um, although we do showcase these incredible airplanes, and today's presentation has been really about these, these airplanes, the metal, um, you know, the, the just sophistication of restoration techniques and so on. Um, our real mission here is not just the preservation of the airplanes. Our mission is about reaching modern audiences with lessons from the greatest generation. And again, we see each of these airplanes as a kind of multifaceted teaching opportunity. So, so what you're looking at here is uh, one of our summer, summer camp classes from a, a pre-COVID year, uh, actually having the opportunity to, to approach the airplane. Now, you know, hopefully we're able to get back to doing that kind of work soon. Uh, we do still have the opportunity to showcase the airplanes. Uh, we do ask that everyone wears a mask and obviously stands uh, further apart than, than this group is currently doing. So what you're seeing here is, again, that kind of commitment to dropping the rope, that we just really do believe that getting up next to these things and, and seeing them as close as you can helps enhance the degree to which you, you think that they're real. Um, so that is pretty much everything I had um, ready to take some questions, John, and uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Excellent. Well, thank you, Keegan. That's absolutely fascinating. Makes me want to visit again. And that is actually my first question. Uh, how have you weathered the pandemic? Uh, and uh, take it you are back open for business. How, how can people visit? 
John, that's a great question, and thank you for asking it. Um, we are open. You can visit us. So we have been open since mid-June. Um, there are mandatory mask use rules in effect, social distancing rules in effect. Um, if you'd like more information on that, uh, specifics of the rules, you can visit our website, militaryaviationmuseum.org. Uh, we are open currently 9 to 5 every day. Um, I will say that uh, winter, in particular January, is about our slowest month. Um, if you wanted a chance to, to experience this museum privately, uh, without the risk of encountering other people or being closer to people than you'd like to be, um, that's definitely, this is a great time of year to do that. We're, we're a hidden gem in our region. Uh, we're doing a lot to, to, to try to bridge that gap and let people know that we're not just a summertime attraction. Uh, but in some ways, uh, if you're hoping to social distance, uh, this period of time where we're maybe getting um, you know, 30 or 40 people a day is actually a good time to visit because they're spread out over a massive facility. Uh, there are pieces of, of our experience here, like I said, with the, the, the maintenance wing, as well as our original World War II uh, control tower relocated from Gox Hill in England, uh, and our original Luftwaffe hangar from Cottbus in Germany. Uh, those buildings are currently not on view because the historic structures don't lend themselves to, to safe sh social distancing. Uh, but you can still see the World War I hangar. You can still see the majority of our World War II airplanes. We kind of overstuffed the hangars here a little bit just to give people the chance to see as much as they possibly could. Um, so it's, it's a great time to visit if you're looking for something safe and, and, and interesting to do. Uh, I know it's a bit of a drive from, from up where you guys are. Uh, in terms of weathering the storm, we, uh, I think we are in the same position that everyone else is where um, so much of what we do is reliant on the support of the public that we, we have to graciously thank everyone who has continued to support us during this period, uh, continued to make gifts, even through our end of year uh, kind of annual ask. Those are the things that are helping us get through. Uh, we have suffered from the loss of every one of our major air show events uh, this past year, and we're you know kind of looking ahead wondering about the schedule for next year as to when is it going to be safe and appropriate to, to be organizing, you know, those kinds of mass events. Uh, what we did do this summer and, and kind of gave us all a glimmer of hope was we were able to, as part of our regular museum operations, uh, fly the airplanes on Saturday afternoons, do that safely. And we've established a good track record there. So we believe that as soon as it uh, dries up around here, we'll be out flying again. And, and we hope that folks would be interested in joining us for that. Uh, Warbirds over the beach, is that scheduled for this year? Or? So Warbirds over the beach is typically held in May. Uh, we haven't currently made a decision um, to postpone it, uh, but we are, again, at, at the board level, um, at the management level, we are carefully watching the, the state re regulations on events um, and also watching the, the confidence in the vaccine rollout and, and so on. Excellent. Uh, same with many of our events. You, you have to plan them so far in advance. Yeah. It's hard call. Uh, so I, I completely understand. Uh, we had a question come in. Uh, what is your personal favorite aircraft in the collection? It's like asking someone what their favorite child is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which one? And, <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I think people go through phases in their life. I, I think everyone's favorite airplane was the Mustang at one point, and then everyone had the Corsair on their favorite airplane list. And I think as you you get older, you kind of mellow and, and start to find that the favorite airplanes are the ones that have kind of special story connections for you. And uh, I think for me, the PBY is, a, is an airplane that is a, is a tremendous um, story to be told. Uh, there just seems to be limitless uh, layers to the onion that is the PBY. It's an unusual airplane. Uh, they're not widely um, kept in museum collections. There are quite a few out there, but many of them are privately owned and you can't go see them. Um, I think what's what's intriguing to me about it is it's kind of like everywhere the PBY shows up, it changes history. Uh, you know, we all, I think many of us World War II enthusiasts know about the role that it plays in the Battle of Midway, locating the Japanese fleet, kind of positioning them uh, to allow the American aircraft to strike against the carrier group and, and so on. Uh, but we don't necessarily all ne realize that, you know, a PBY in, in Royal Air Force Coastal Command Service is what found the Bismarck uh, when it had slipped away and uh, was going to break out into the convoy lanes of the North Atlantic. It was a PBY up in the cloud deck that, that located the Bismarck. Um, the Japanese planned a, a similar attack to Pearl Harbor against uh, the, the Royal Navy at its bases in Ceylon, and a PBY found them. And can you imagine, you know, how history would have turned out differently had we found the Japanese fleet a day before Pearl Harbor? Uh, the British had that luxury because a PBY did find them. 
uh, they were able to prepare for it. They were able to repulse the attack and they were, the Japanese were not successful in destroying the Royal Navy in the Indian Ocean. Um, they were, because of that, they couldn't connect and, and have freedom of navigation between them and the Germans and, and all the things that the Axis powers had aspired to. Um, so you can path these incredible historical moments back to this kind of unwieldy, unusual airplane uh, that can stay in the air for 13 straight hours without the addition of extra refueling equipment. And uh, But it does all of that basically at the speed of smell. Uh, you know, the airplane is, is kind of puttering along just over 100 miles an hour doing all of those things. So I... Mm -hmm. I just I find it a, it's an interesting sort of contradiction. Um, so that, that I, I guess would say my current favorite airplane, but uh, it'd be a toss up between that and the Mosquito because there's just something completely special about seeing the Mosquito fly as well. Um, we were the only place in the world this year that you could go as a member of the public and, and see one fly. Uh, that's the same story was replicated when we flew our um, Ju-52 earlier in the year. Uh, there were a number flying in Europe. There were a number flying all over everywhere, but um, none of them flew this year. And uh, ours was one of the few you could come and see. Let me uh, take the question in a, in a different direction. What's on your wish list? What if you could ask Santa next year for a particular plane you don't have? What would it be? I think that um, <laughs> I think to be to be more more uh, to take it slightly in a different direction because I, I you know um i don't want to reveal what projects and so on we have in process i i think where we're we're headed from a, a collections orientation perspective is that we're we're looking at um you know rounding out some of the the airplanes from the american perspective that are missing from our collection and we have a great foreign collection that has emerged in the last number of years um, you know, mosquitoes, hurricanes, spitfires. Uh, but we do know uh, that there are American airplanes missing from the collection. We do know that, uh, you know, our principal audience here in Virginia Beach is an American audience that is interested in hearing the stories uh, that have truth to place for us here in this country. Uh, so I think what we what we see on the horizon from a collections perspective is a desire to acquire the last of the iconic American airplanes. Um, I'll let you all look at the list of what we have versus what we don't have and, and assess uh, what, what you think is, is iconic, but um, e examples would be things like a P-38. Uh, we don't have one. Uh, I think people people know that, that, that fork-tailed airplane anywhere and uh, that there is a, a dimension of the war and the experience in the South Pacific, particularly with P-38s, that, that would be well represented here. Um, but there isn't an imminent acquisition plan necessarily. And it, it is something that, you know, if I was going to ask Santa for something, that'd probably be what I would ask. Uh, though the institution's goals are not necessarily mine alone. Uh, so I have to say more 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 broadly, um, I think we're looking to to sort of backfill some of the American airplanes that, that we don't have. Excellent. Well, keep us posted on that. Uh, I would love to see a P-38 there. Uh, but uh, we are about out of time. So I want to thank you, Keegan, for joining us. Uh, a fascinating look and encourage all of our viewers. Uh, take the trip out to Virginia Beach. You won't regret it. It's a fascinating visit. Uh, but on behalf of the National D-Day Memorial, thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to our next Lunchbox Lecture in two weeks, where we'll discuss the Dieppe Raid with our uh, volunteer and tour guide, Dick Elder. So join us two weeks from, from today for that. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John.